Thank you all so much uh, for coming. Uh, welcome to FACT. Uh, my name is Maitri Maheshri. I'm the head of program here. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a real honor to be moderating this conversation. We've got wonderful speakers uh, in person and remotely. Um, and yeah, this is the first time uh, we've done a live event like this in a year and a half. So it's it's very exciting for us. It's very exciting to have people back in the building uh, and attending things. Um, but we're obviously still very much affected by COVID. So our two speakers are joining us remotely uh, because of uh, COVID reasons. Um, I wanted to kind of start by giving a little bit of context about why we're here today. Um, so, God, probably about 10 months ago, um, I had a conversation with uh, artist and filmmaker Bafa Koto, who's here with us. Uh, about a project that he wanted to do uh, marking the 10th uh, anniversary of um, the riots uh, that took place uh, in 2011, starting uh, that started in Tottenham in North London and spread across the country. Um, and Bath wanted to work on a project that was really looking at what's happened over the last 10 years um, and also thinking about how the coverage of that period really framed uh, an understanding of not only uh, young people, young black people in, in the country, but also really changed the shape of um, how technology affects uh, our understanding of um, social protests and organizing and community organizing. Um, the project Uprise uh, is accessible through uh, an AR QR code. It, there's a poster on the outside of the building, but there's also um, QR codes around the city. Um, the events of 10 years ago were sort of triggered by um, the police killing of a black man in Tottenham. And um, while the media represented the events uh, with a sort of sensationalized menace and they were very eager to sort of portray all the young people involved as looters and vandals the the inequalities the decades-long inequalities that and disenfranchisement that sort of lay at the heart of a lot of uh, that anger uh, which had also been further exacerbated by government austerity um, none of those things were really explored or discussed in uh, the media at the time, um, and they continue to remain largely overlooked. Um, in Liverpool, Toxteth became the focal point of that rebellion in 2011, as it had been in 1981, and numerous other points in across the 20th century, starting with the race riots of 1919, um, and also coming right up to date last year with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and that obviously was in response um, that sort of was Black Lives Matter has been a sort of very active movement in the US, but it sort of made a sort of global leap um, last year um, in response to the killing of George Floyd in America. Um, so what we wanted to do today in terms of this conversation was really to think about not only how the tools and technologies have evolved over the last decade um, since 2011 to really help the individuals who are shaping kind of culture and protest and organization, community organization, how they the tools and technologies are being used by the communities um, today, um, not just to kind of give visibility to the issues that they're facing, but also to kind of change the narrative, to kind of rethink representation. Um, we have great speakers. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be doing very minimal talking. Um, and our wonderful speakers are gonna be doing a lot more. Um, I'm gonna ask them all to introduce themselves. Um, and then I'm gonna start us off with a question and then we'll see where we go. We'll probably talk for about 45 minutes and then turn over to you guys for, for more questions. So I'm gonna start with alphabetically uh, as I've got it, uh, B. Hi, um, yes, my name is B Freeman. I'm a producer director independent producer director. I've been involved with uh, film and documentary filmmaking now for the past 25 years. Um, in particular, one of the things I do most is document the black communities. And I've uh, been doing that, as I said, since the 80s. Also been involved with uh, films as well with uh, BBC, Channel 4, 
uh, worked at the Afro-Caribbean unit for a long time, also was part of the Black on Black series, uh, looking at the political programmes. Um, I was also commissioned in 19, I think it was about 1985, to make a film on the 1981 riots. Um, and again, what you know, we're talking about changing the narrative and their perception then when that they wanted me to make that film was, you know, young black uh, youth, you know, smoking, you know, dope over a billiard table. But what we did, we changed the narrative on that film and we shot the film. Sorry. I want, I want to do intros and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. Okay, okay, <laughs> right, okay, sorry about that. So that's my involvement. Um, most recently, I've just done a film on the Windrush called Daughters of the Windrush. Um, I was one of the members of the first Black Media Workers Association that was set up uh, in the late 80s, early 90s to enable young people to get into the media in front and behind the screen. Um, I've been involved in a lot of uh, black filmmaking over the years. Um, we also changed uh, the training uh, within the union because what also happened um, was the ACTT, which is now BET2, um, you couldn't get a job unless you had a union card. You couldn't get a union card unless you had a job. And the, so Black Media Workers Association, we changed that. Um, you know, we've seen some change. We're, we're getting more, you know, we're visible on screen as well as behind. So I was involved as part of that movement. Also in a lot of political campaigning here in Liverpool, because we got the first, uh, through the Liverpool Black Organisation, we got our first elected councillor. Um, and we, you know, and some of the businesses in Liverpool have changed somewhat. You know, again, changing the narrative. So that's partly my background. I could go on, <laughs> but I won't. I'll, I'll move over. So I'm going to hand. I'm going to ask Blue to introduce yourself. Yeah. So as you said there, um, thank you. Um, um, many people just call me Blue. I'm Daniel Sibiyange. Um, also my professional name is Blue Saint. I'm a music artist, spoken word artist, um, actor, just all everyday creative uh, artist, I suppose. Um, and I've worked with uh, from, uh, for, as a young child uh, from like ages 11 to 12 to maybe like 15. I was with Liverpool Young Writers um, and then uh, I've, I'm, I'm winner of the Maisie Rail Sound Station um, and I'm known quite a lot for doing quite a lot of uh, community activism I worked with a lot of projects in my younger years up till now uh, such as Tiber uh, based in Toxteth um, as well as a few others but it'd be a, I, I've, I don't have the best memory so I'd have to be like <laughs> going back in my head to kind of figure it out um, but yeah that's just me in a nutshell um, yeah and then everyone just calls me blue thank you thank you uh, Chantel Hi, my name's Chantal Luntz and I'm a writer, entrepreneur, educator and activist. Um, I'm probably best known as the founder of Merseyside BLM Alliance. I'm also the chair of Merseyside Alliance for Racial Equality. I have a juice and smoothie bar called The Little Green Juice Box and I work as an educator for the Black Curriculum. Amazing, thank you. And last but not least, Francesca. Hi everyone, I'm Francesca Sabandi and I'm a lecturer in Digital Media Studies at Cardiff University. Um, I'm from Scotland, now based in Wales, Scottish and Welsh, and a lot of my work has focused on the media and digital experiences of Black women in Britain. Um, I've also been working on a project for a number of years with a good friend, writer and independent um, researcher and organiser on Black history and Black lives in Scotland. So we've got a book on that, that's hopefully coming out next year um, with Zed Books in Bloomsbury. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, so I have to I have to start this conversation by saying that I'm new to the city. I only moved here 18 months ago. So I want to start by understanding, and this is this is really directed at the the the, the those who have scousers amongst you, um, um about understanding why Liverpool is so politicized. Because as a, as someone who moved here, you, you get a sense very much that people are very actively engaged. Um, in change, actively engaged in politics. Um, and I, I think I'd read, you know, um, Chantal, having been so actively involved in sort of setting up the Merseyside Lives uh, Matter Alliance, that's the most recent 
uh, kind of manifestation that I've seen and it was so sort of visible last summer. Um, but I'd be really interested to understand what it is about growing up in the city or living in the city that makes people um, be much, much more perhaps uh, civically minded or focused on change and the kind of politics of change than in other places because um, what comes across obviously externally in the media media representation of it and we'll talk about that more um, is the rioting or the kind of the very sort of uh, violent nature of, of some of that sort of political change but um, that's got to start from somewhere and that means yeah where does it start for you? I think as a city, we've historically been others, haven't we? You know, since the Thatcher years, we'd be kind of tried the whole managed decline thing of Liverpool. They really wanted Liverpool to go under. And then if we go like a little bit further on and look at what happens with Hillsborough, the media campaign, that there was just a hate campaign against the city. And I think when you're othered like that, you know, whether it be through the media, whether it be the Tories, whether it be the politics, and even the rest of the UK have this really strong view of Scousers as, you know, the bottom of the battle, thieves, no goods, really common, have this really strong view of Scousers. You're forced to create this positive identity, and it's a bit like, you know, the black identity where, because you've got this re real, a lot of negative stereotypes thrown around about, yeah, you're then forced to create a real positive stereotype and come together as a community. I feel like that's what happens in Liverpool because since the 80s since the 70s they've really kind of gone at us as a city they've always tried to break our spirit we've actually rejected that and we've created an even stronger community which is all around community support activism holding each other up holding the government to account and calling out the media you know it's we're the only city that's ever kicked out the sun we're one of the only cities that's got a strong sense of socialism within like our very makeup we're kind of we're not really English. That's kind of what you get in Liverpool with Scouts. And it's it's something that you can't, you don't get that feeling anywhere else. It's like I travel a lot, especially with activism up and down the country. And I've never seen that sense of kind of group identity outside of the black community anywhere else other than Liverpool. It's kind of, it's like we are Scousers. And when I say I'm a Scouser, that's something that I'm proud of, which means that if you are coming for my city, then you're coming for my community and we're going to fight you. And, and that's why when something, ha but it's it, when something happens to one of us, something happens to all of us. So when we do say, you know, Black Lives Matter, when we do say women's rights, when we do say something is happening and we need to all get out on the streets, you'll see a lot more people in Liverpool than you will in other cities. So I think it's that process of, of being othered by people in positions of power and constantly having an incorrect narrative pedals about us in terms of who we are as people. We fought so hard against that. So it's, it's kind of just ingrained in our identity that we will resist and we will recognise that oppression in other people. So when we see what, when we see that other people are going through something that we've been through, we're like, no, we reject that as well. We're one of the only cities outside of London to hold a monthly vigil for Grenfell. And that's because we know what, you know what I mean? We know what it's like to suffer loss. We know what it's like to have the government lie and lie and lie about the people who have died. And so that's why Grenfell know that in Liverpool they've got an ally and they'll always have an ally 100 percent yeah yeah 100 percent I'd, I'd have to piggyback on what Chantal that said there like when we were doing the um the uh the documentary that um called Toxic Rising um that came out recently um something uh Gunan uh, Adamu said as well was there uh, and, and I've heard many other people saying Liverpool, including myself, is like Liverpool's its own country sort of thing. You know what I mean, like it feels like it's, it's like it's, it's its own, um, like its own place. You know what I mean? Like I watched their, uh, I watched their, uh, a, a theatre show, the kids, it's what did as well. Um, that was based around imagine if Liverpool was was its own country and things like that. Um, so it, it definitely does fall on the um, on on the way in which. We're, we're we're viewed from the outside like uh, like uh, you, you you tend to band together more when 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 you're other than it so it's like it's 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 that it's that sort of um that it's, it, it stems from that sort of uh, dynamic i remember also in the, like so you'll notice quite a lot of artists say it, quite a lot of people local say it. So another artist that, uh, that i'll also uh, mention him um, mc nelson he dropped there, uh, a song um last year i think and he called their um the people Repu the people's republic of liverpool so there's always got that concept of like 
we're in like we're in our own sort of world like we're we're all together so yeah 100 agree with what chantal said there yeah i mean i can go a bit further i mean one of the things about the black community in Liverpool, I mean, we're the, we're the oldest black community in the UK. We go right back to the 1700s. And a lot of the families here in Liverpool can trace our ancestry back. But we've always been underrepresented all the time in education, jobs. And that's why, uh, as groups, we form the Liverpool Black Organisation. We can go right back to when Charles Wotton was the 1919 riots and we can see what happened there and that's why the black community has had to keep itself together because we've always been underrepresented um you know we're on to third and fourth generation now Liverpool born blacks and yet you know it's only now that we're seeing you know some um a disparity or togetherness you know of education um, you know, if you still look at the universities, you know, disproportionately, you know, we're still un underrepresented in all those areas. But as a community, we've we've recognized that we've come together, um, not just like in in over riots, we've come together over other issues as well. Um, a lot of you might not know the history of the Fletcher report and the way we were represented in the Fletcher report that we were the products of uh, prostitutes and sailors. Um, that's how, you know, a, a reporter um, described um, Liverpool black youth at the time, that we were a non-entity. Black children were a non-entity. And that was came out of an academic piece of research at, from Liverpool University called the Fletcher Report. And so that's, you know, that view of how they viewed us that, you know, I'm going back like to that report came out in the late 50s, early 60s. And so that's why we've had this togetherness where we've had to come together and defend ourselves as a community and take action. Um, and that Act, action has come about, you know, not from years and years ago, but also, you know, we can see it today, uh, how we've been, you know, underrepresented in this city in terms of how is it, you know, whatever it is there. It's like we were, a, you know, they were saying we were a non-entity and that's how we were feeling, we were, you know. But, they, you know, this thing about, um, you know, Toxteth, the name Toxteth only ever came about after 1981. It was never known as Toxteth. It was L8. And that, you, you know, and we still call it L8, not Toxteth. It was the media that described it. So, yes, I agree with you, Chantel. Um, and my other colleagues here, Blue. <laughs> um, the way we, because we've been up underrepresented in the past, that togetherness, and we do come together and defend our, our area, defend our individuals, defend our community um, and take, you know, and knock people away who want to see us as other. I mean, thank you. That, that actually, it, it, that really helps to kind of contextualize it. And one of the things that strikes me that's, that's really interesting about how it's a community that's feeling in its entirety that entirety that it's not just sort of l8 but it's it's kind of like a city-wide thing as well um i suppose one of the questions that comes comes next to me is about leadership because this isn't you know how does a community organize itself to be able to change its its story or push back or come back to a different kind of identity um and and this this kind of leads us into the kind of questions about representation and community organization, but how does leadership kind of, what role does leadership play within the Liverpool context? You know, when we see the riots, it always feels kind of chaotic and disorderly, and that is the media representation of them, but there's also something else happening behind that where communities are making things happen for themselves. Well, um, I'm just looking at the night, talking about the 1981 rioters like as you said people said it was looting the riot started um because of Leroy Cooper being arrested 
on the 8th of Ju on a Friday afternoon on the 8th of July. Um, and it was the police who, because he'd got off with his court case, said, we're going to have you. And, you know, um, that's how all that started. And it was the young people that defended him when they tried to rearrest him. That's how it all started. Uh, but, you know, I was part of the Liverpool Aid Defence Committee and we quickly formed that committee to enable the community to get help wherever needed because they arrested on that night of the 8th of July and it was the 4th, the 5th and the 6th. They arrested hundreds and hundreds of young people um, for no apparent reason at all. They were just seeing it, all, oh, you're a looter, you're a looter. And, you know, so we very quickly formed the Liverpool Aid Defence Committee and we formed that in the old Charles Watton Centre in Upper Parliament Street because we realised uh, that legal representative was required right away to get kids out of Walton Prison. And so you're talking about leadership. I mean, people very quickly come together uh, to form leadership and the Defence Committee was the leadership at that time. And out of that, of course, stemmed um, the Liverpool Aid Law Centre. That's what came out of the Defence Committee and out of the riots for the, for the community. Would you say that that's kind of changed over, over time? So, Chantal, when thinking about the Black Lives Matter Alliance, um, how, 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 does, how does something like that come about? Because it's so outward facing, it's so connected to other um sort of i guess i don't know how you describe it other alliances affiliated in in sort of solidarity with black lives matter both within the uk and internationally how does this idea of kind of communities coming together to take charge of a situation how has that changed from the sort of situation that bees just described i'd say it's a lot similar to how bees described i'd say the process is always just a reaction the process will always be reactive we don't know what about to process we don't know what about to be on the street we don't we didn't know it was going to happen but it happened and we kind of all had to just get out there and kind of hit the ground running and part of that is finding out what the current setup is so for example in la's at the moment the setup's a little bit different in merseyside than it was the black community la's been gentrified massively there's only 25 percent of the black community left there which means 75 percent of us are now really scattered which also means we're really vulnerable because we're isolated in areas where we're not the majority we're actually the minority so a big part of blm was okay what does our black community in merseyside look like now where is our black community what are the experiences of racism and also what are those intersections because i think if you think of like blm like feminism with each wave something new happens and i'd say this wave of blm was very much about looking at the intersections of black identities and also focusing on the experiences of black people in marginalized areas the black people who kind of haven't got the community to protect them who are you know in heighten where poor Anthony walker was in Hale Woods, where I am, where there's only usually about 1% of us and we experience a real, you know, real racism from the 80s around here. So I think that was a, a key to understand, OK, how are you experiencing racism depending on where you were, where you live geographically in the region and also who you are as a person, you know, me as a black woman, someone who might be black and LGBT, what does racism look like for you? So once we got that, then there was the kind of organising part that Bee's spoken about. So one thing that we set up after we'd, you know, kind of <laughs> taken, taken stock of everything that was going on was we set up a CIC so that we could go into the community and do the work because we had a good idea of what work needed to be done because we've been on the ground. But for us, I'd say the biggest difference between the ACs and now is technology because of technology it wasn't like and because of COVID I have a son who shields and so most of my stuff was done on Zoom we were able to reach more people also a national network also an international network and organize a lot quicker than I think they did in the 80s we were able to coordinate you know actions in different areas we were able to join up groups so the groups that I'm connected with although the the kinds of scatters around the UK there's some all the way up in Leeds there's some you know down in Sandbach and rural areas we're kind of connected around the needs of the people in our communities so a lot of the groups that I connect with are groups where a lot of the black community are quite marginalized where they live so we have although we're geographically sporadic we're everywhere we've got similar issues so that's kind of what brings us together and then we'll connect to a bigger network sort of as a group so I think 
technology definitely helped us to organize it definitely helped us to understand what the situation was nationally and internationally and it helped us to figure out what our next steps were and also to support each other so I think I think what the police were really worried about is which is why they've redefined a few laws in the past year um they called us aggravated activists which basically sort of puts us in the same category as a terrorist and to be an aggravated activist all you have to do is travel from one city to another and basically speak at a protest and I think that's what freaked the police out because it was like why are all these people turning up from other cities in like Sandbach or Stoke why are they in London why aren't they just in their area and it was because we were connected we knew what was going on we knew that someone had been stabbed and they needed support we knew that there was you know a young lad who was locked up for no good reason in London and we got there and we stood there with other protesters and it really shook them because it's like why is this scouser in London you know she should be down in Liverpool what's going on so I think technology really did help Help us to strategize, organize, and be effective for our communities. Um, I want to bring Francesca in because I feel like this is also Francesca is such a huge part of the research that you've been doing in terms of, um, particularly thinking about women and uh, sort of the digital activism that that sort of and organizing that has happened historically to present day in terms of how technology has really changed that and uh, it would be really great to get your thoughts on 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 those shifts that have happened over time as well sure yeah i think i've been looking at quite a lot of this in particular since 2015 i mean personally i've, I've always been interested in, in doing work that relates to these things but from 2015 to this point the digital and the rise of um, social media and online content sharing platforms and how that shapes experiences of activism and collective organizing is something i've been focusing on a lot and i feel as though you know one of the the positives that we're reflecting on here is how what would once perhaps be confined to a particular local area and um, you know an issue something that happens experiences of anti-blackness there is a real opportunity to connect with people across different regions and um, within britain and beyond so transnational forms of solidarity have been incredibly encouraging looking at the different ways that what's going on in in one part of um, the uk is an experience that is relatable for black people around the world and i think the flip side of all this um, or maybe before moving on to thinking about some more of the negatives something else that i think is exciting when we look at the different ways that black people have been using digital technology to come together and um, to collaborate and to hold individuals and institutions accountable is the ways that leadership is challenged. So I think, you know, ideas to do with leadership sometimes can be incredibly hierarchical and can uphold the same sorts of power dynamics that people are wanting to push against. And I definitely wouldn't say that digital technology has completely democratized things because we know that because of anti-blackness, because of the forms of online harassment, abuse and surveillance that black people face, um, digital tech is far from being any sort of simple solution. But I would say that we have have seen people who ordinarily would not necessarily be able to reach the number of people that they can now being able to change things, being able to amplify what's going on, being able to do work in a way that previously they might not have been able to. So I'm just conscious that sometimes when we think about leadership, those who are most marginalized um, at, within different black communities aren't necessarily the people associated with leadership, but they are still the people who are doing very important work. And I think that digital media and social media has been really helpful in that way. And um, I'll maybe just sort of leave thoughts here by saying that I'm always conscious of surveillance I'm always conscious um, as Chantel was speaking about of you know the intersections of these different issues so whether that's anti-blackness sexism homophobia transphobia the fact that there are a lot of risks involved in being visible online and I'm also aware that there are people doing incredible work with the use of digital technology in pretty private underground ways so I think sometimes it's good to reflect on the fact that the work that's happening is not always visible. And that's because it's important to do work in ways that is gonna be most impactful, but it's also not gonna be at the cost of the health and wellbeing of the very black people doing that work. Yeah, and, and on that on that note, um, and tops, on, on, the, um, on the thought of like work that isn't all, um, necessarily visible, but, still, but just as effective, and um, the ways in which I, I came into like, um, developing leadership sort of skills and activism was was uh, in my younger years going to youth centers 
Um, so it was like the youth youth leaders and things like that um, got me involved in quite a lot of different projects and a lot of my peers too because um, they already had active like they already had community activists and um, that were also youth leaders there that were there that, that, that encourage us and empower us and then give us the necessary skills um, needed in order to also teach the next generation in fact we, we did a a project called Next Generation Speaks um, that was on that, um, that, that, that was its, its whole theme was to give, um, was to empower artists to not just to not just uh, use the creative skills to perform, but to also um, be able to um, uh, be, be good facilitators or workshop leaders or, or um, uh, community leaders and things like that to give um, the next generation the, the necessary tools in order to continue um, uh, passing on the baton. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, no, I, I, I wanna pick up on Francesca's point about the negative aspects, but what you just said brought another question to mind, which was about this relationship between art and activism. Um, and I guess wanting to understand to what extent your creative practice, both of you particularly, is fueled by a sort of activist impulse or to what extent you see the work that you make as being a sort of legacy of the activism that you do? Could you, could you read Yeah, that? no, so I guess, do you think of your work as being activist in why you do it? Or do you see the activism that as kind of the, the art that you make or, or the work that you make as being the kind of, I guess, the legacy of all of the other activism stuff that you do? Like, how do you balance those two things? For me, I think it's a bit of both because like, I, I still have the the the, uh, the mind state of, um, from even hearing what B is saying, like things that I, I wasn't there for like the, in the 1980s, but knowing the history, like understanding that we're just standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, there's got, um, there's got all, all this work that's been done beforehand that, that has influenced me. Um, and then, and then knowing that the, the work that I do, um, I do, um, with with the, with the mind state of wanting to um, be act, be an activist, but not but not but also still feeling free enough to just create, just to create for just for fun. Um, but yeah, so it's a bit of both. It's like the idea of me fully understanding that um, a lot of the things that that I that I'm able to do now, um, uh, other other people already paved the way for that. Um, and just kind of continuing that sort of legacy. Um, yeah, I suppose the, you know, the body of work that I've produced over the years, I would say, you know, it's a legacy, but it's also part of uh, the activism and what I believed in and how I wanted to shape. That's why I became an independent producer, because I wanted to shape the work I was doing my way rather than what the establishment wanted and so all the films that I've made I mean they are a legacy but they're all part of activism I mean for example when the Channel 4 commissioned us to do the the film on the 1981 riots their view of how they wanted it made was totally different than what we wanted they just wanted you know a group of young black youth over a billiard table you know that picture that they always had and what we did actually on that, first of all, we needed the story to be told from the people who are affected. And so what we did with the youth, um, we formed a, a media company. We formed them into a media company. And so we got them to get the commission. I was a producer, but we got them to be commissioned by Channel 4. So they became the company and they then employed other people to do the technical but they told the story and so we turned the whole film upside down because we said who benefits from riots and so we had to look at Liverpool and the history of riots we went right back to 1919 and we were fortunate um, when we made the film we still had a, per a gentleman who passed now who knew and was involved in the 1919 riots and we looked at the 1948 riots, we looked at the 72 riots, and our big question or the story what was being told, who benefits, and it was not the black community. And so that's how they made, and then 
interspersed with that, we brought in the art side of it because Levi Tafari is involved in a um, other artist. And so we told a story in quite a different and radical way than what was what the establishment wanted. So again, yet yeah, so you know the legacy we're talking about, you know, activism, and so through that film, you know, you see all of that coming through. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting and it's so important to kind of consider who's telling the story in yes. in all of this because I think one of the things that has really changed um, for better and for worse over the last decade is that because of mobile phone technology in particular, smartphones, everyone has the capacity to tell the story. Everyone has the capacity to be able to give visibility to to their story, um, and that that isn't a you know we're no longer reliant on mainstream media to to shape or frame that narrative, um, and and all of the kind of sort of pitfalls that 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 put, throws up. But um, what that also does is when you have everyone telling their story, how do you actually create that sense of solidarity? How do you create um, that sense where uh, people aren't fighting against each other, uh, pe people are kind of taking their own stories and bringing together to come together for a shared cause, which might not be exactly their problem or their cause or their issues. How do you stop that sort of fragmentation when actually all we're, we're, we're encouraged to do by the media company, by the social media companies and platforms is to generate content for other people yeah. to consume. Yeah. So this tension between um, self-representation and uh, and then sort of being trapped in your own bubble is something that I think is maybe one of the the pitfalls that Francesca was alluding to also. Yeah, I guess um, what I was thinking about as well is just this, this tension between the potential for social media and digital technology to be used as part of really important black liberationist work and then re the reality that a lot of these platforms are commercial in nature they weren't made um, by or for black people or certainly were not made to support this sort of work so i think it's about reflecting on what does that mean in terms of some of the the trade-offs that can involve and also as everybody's been speaking about right now i think there's sometimes a risk that there's such an emphasis on sort of recent months or recent years that we forget that what we're seeing right now is an extension of the work of those who came before this work isn't happening because of the technology but people are using the technology in really impactful ways so i think i'm just mindful of We've seen so many brands and organisations, especially since you know, sort of last spring, suddenly wanting to be seen and um, to be interested in or claiming to be invested in the lives of black people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes doing that in ways that involves them tapping into or sort of trying to piggyback off of what black people are posting and sharing on online. And for me, that doesn't mean that there aren't still really great opportunities for technology and social media to be used as part of the work we're discussing. I think it's just about um, how people stay ahead of or, or do things in a way that involves pushing back or trying to subvert those organizations that are just ultimately interested in profit and are, are often based on anti-Black foundations as well. So thinking about racial capitalism um, and what, what it means when it comes to recognizing both the benefits and limitations of digital technology for the sort of causes and the sort of work that we're discussing right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to jump to piggyback on what Francesca was saying there as well. Um, like looking at, at also the negative um, sides, because of course, uh, like such as um, people sometimes just doing things because it's a trend and um, because it's a trend and topic and things like that. For instance, um, beautiful but great thing that occurred was a uh, um with the was the black squares that happened but um but then there would also be people who who would just do it to uh, as virtue signal signaling and things like that um and then there's also got um in, in terms of information the great thing about technology is, is like everybody's got a mobile phone um so it's it's very easy to, to to gain information but on that on the flip side it's also very easy to gain misinformation um so it's it's like it, it, the, the, when it comes to, to technology because it has so much power there's there's an added weight to it and making sure that um that balance is there and like and proper research is also conducted um as well I just I wanted to just add there to what Francesca was saying yeah I just wanted to say I think it, it does have to be coupled with action that's the key thing we can't just have social media without action it's like 
Without social media, we wouldn't have had BLM 2020. There wouldn't have been the biggest civil black civil rights movement that the world has ever seen. That happened because of social media, but it didn't just happen because of social media. It also happened because social media drove people to get out, get on the street, get into the communities, get into the offices, get into the boardrooms and carry that conversation on. So it can't just happen single, singularly. It can't happen on, it, on its own. It has to happen kinds of with other actions that were taken out into the community and it has to also be kind of directors which I think is why the BLM groups and the BLM leaders were really essential because they were kind of leading the conversation and driving it in a certain way and saying okay today we need to focus on this this month we need to focus on this we need to be posting about this which is why hashtags are great but for me the biggest benefit of social media was that it allowed us to have a counter narrative because I feel like without social media we would have just been thugs like we were back in 2011. We would have just been, you know, criminals like we were in 1981. We would have just been uneducated black people crying over not and like they've called us time and time again. The only difference this time round was we were able to say, no, this is who we are. And we were able to show, show the world who we were as people. And that is why we had the most kind of white allyship, the most allyship from LGBT communities, from communities who have never stood with us before, because this is the first time we had a platform that we could show them who we were. And that is what the government and everyone else who's tried to bring BLM down have struggled with time and time again. They cannot counteract our narrative because we've been able to hold ourselves up via social media and say, no, this is what we're doing. We're not fighting. We're protesting peacefully. And we've got a message. We've got something that we want you to do. So I think it's been really, really powerful. But like sort of Blue says and like Francesca said, there's also that kind of whole, you know, the black square, the commercialization like people saying that they're about black people, you know, buy this BLM t-shirt, but you won't employ someone to sell it. So it's it's a sort of double-edged sword, but I think it's been, as a black community, it's been our most powerful tool, especially during the pandemic. Just quickly, um, just so, Chantal, that was great. This just made me think about, um, about um, evidence as well, like by having social media and videos and capturing, I mean, it, the reason why, the, the, the 2020s the protests occurred and um, was that we, we 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 all saw what happened do you know what I mean like it couldn't really be put like we um put under the rug as as it was back back in the day like um he say she say like because the the, the 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 nobody was able to capture the um the events whatever tragedies were the care so that that's another great powerful um um thing about social media like we 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 can actually we've actually got the receipts do you know what I mean so I mean, mm-hmm. someone's like oh no no, that didn't happen he's like no it did I've, I've got the video right here do you know what i mean or i've got this or uh, um this screenshot of what this person said or what the ceo said or wherever else it is so that that's also um uh, a very um powerful thing about social media yeah it's able to hold people to account exactly yes. yeah very much so um uh yeah i totally agree with you Chantel. i mean what i've seen um you know every time you've put on your your computer there's another organization that you know they're contributing saying this is our statement on blm and i'm still waiting to see well are they going to employ anybody who are on the board on the boards are all putting out these statements but when are we going to see the change when is it going to be implemented we you know words anybody can say as many words as they want to but what we're looking for now you know through Black Lives Matter as well is the check we need to see the change. I think I think the other thing that that points to uh, holding holding people to account, but also it's that opportunity to change how you know what Chantal was saying about well this is who we are. Well, the 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 community isn't just uh, victims or predisposed to criminality which is where how the news media tends to represent black communities either as victims of something or as perpetrators of something um what's the other narrative where's the kind of the kind of positive force where's the positive kind of messaging and imaging around what what the communities are actually doing and how people are living their lives and i think mainstream media definitely ignores that quite a lot but i I don't know how you feel whether social media is an appropriate platform for, for that I think it's been a really powerful platform for that especially meme culture don't ever underestimate the power of meme culture <laughs> um you know back in the 40s and the 30s there were does anyone hear of the penny postcards 
It was yeah. basically a thing in America that they did after the end of slavery. And it was another way to keep black people down because they had to have a way of, you know, having a kind of hierarchy without having a legal hierarchy. So they created all these penny postcards with images of black women and black men, just really derogatory images, portraying black women as violent and domineering and black men quite inappropriately making fun of the genitalia and their intellect and things like that. That's actually pulled through to meme culture. So there's a lot of memes out there, you know, racist memes and memes that just perpetuate these images of black people as fake or criminals. And a beautiful thing that's come out of BLM and just a, a black Twitter in general, uh, there's just incredible. And this is where art kind of comes into activism. There are artists out there who just put out fantastic imagery. I remember before Disney started like making black princesses mainstream, there were artists who did like every Disney princess as a black princess and, you know, put images out there of black families, you know, black nuclear families, black people in positions of power. And so you can go onto the internet and you can be empowered as a black person and you can see things that, yeah, they're starting to put it in adverts and on mainstream media now, but before it was there, it was on social media. So I feel like social media does drive what then can go into the media. And a lot of the conversations, like something which is, you know, it's a, a double-edged sword again, but something that's quite powerful is a lot of the discussions we'll have in our group on BLM, in our little Facebook group about, you know, why don't we see more of this in the media? Why don't we see more of this on the news? We have a lot of reporters in the group and they'll go and do a story about it and they'll start reporting on the things that we're saying. Well, they, they never report on this. They never do this. They'll actually take that on board and they'll go out and they'll go, okay, today we're going to talk about mixed race families where the mother is black and the children are lighter skin because we don't always see that in the media. So... I do think social media, it can be just this way. It's awful, obviously, we've all been on the Daily Mail comments section, but it can be this beautiful space where you can drive forward a conversation that then spills over into mainstream media. And, I, you know, I think as, a, it, you know, I'm, I'm 30 odd now, but I didn't see myself in the media and I didn't see myself in imagery and in cartoons and anywhere when I was younger. But I think about young people now and like my son, he can see himself whenever he opens his phone. He can see people like who look like him and he can see them doing amazing things just because there's someone out there on a computer creating it. So I do think that's something to be celebrated and I do think it's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, I was just gonna so I was just gonna I'm just gonna say I can can agree more. I completely agree with with all of exactly that. And I, I was just gonna add something that I've been really interested in is the role of whether it's meme culture, black Twitter, and black digital experiences in archives. So as part of that project I mentioned earlier on um, with Leela Roxanne Hill and Black History and Black Lives in Scotland, we've been looking at different archives um, and also doing interviews and you know speaking to black people right now and um, looking at media pieces from decades ago and media in this moment. And we were just reflecting on the importance of the different ways that archives function right now. And so much of what's happening um, in digital spaces, it can be sort of short term in nature, it can be lost. And that can sometimes be good when it comes to posting something that you, you need to be disappeared and um, for, you, need to, you, need to you need for that to disappear shortly after. Um, although I would caveat that by saying there, again, the risks of surveillance, what we think is deleted or what we think disappears doesn't always disappear and um, but yeah I guess what I was thinking throughout all of this is just the fact that what we're, we're discussing these are black artifacts this is black history this is black memory making happening in real time and I think it's very easy for mainstream media to dismiss what's going on online to trivialize it and um, to use terms such as slacktivism that don't really capture the importance of all of this and the fact that it can be a source of joy it can be a source of pleasure but it can also be the way that people are documenting what's happening now for future generations too. Slacktivism was something that I was I was also interested in as a general thing of like how now that everything now that you can share your sort of solidarity with something with a single single click of a signing a petition, how do you actually genuinely engage people uh, to to take action? What what Chantal, you talked a little bit about the social media needed to be backed up by action mm. um but what are the what how how do you inspire action when it isn't just a click of a button it's got if it's got loads of different ways and um, like so again like, going back to what i said with me it was just by going to different projects by by being out there you know like um 
with the great thing with social media, such as what with Marshawn Tells, it got with BL, uh, the BLM um, Alliance, and and there's got so many other groups as well online. And um, you can find they're all there. You can you can find these groups. You know you can you can uh, uh, make like and the, you can join and like find out uh, what 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 sort of a. Uh, actions because they've got they've all got actions you know within the groups like what sort of actions to take um uh, with me before knowing about groups and things like that when i was younger like i said it was like in the youth centers and being told about oh there's got this project happening in the kumbarmani there's got this project happening over here and so it talks uh, tv or wherever else um so it's just about just just going out there or like we've, we've got google as well you know we live in the age of google so like you can you can literally just um uh, if you uh, want to learn more one of the biggest things as well is um in order to avoid misinformation and things like educating yourself you know what i mean um and just uh, asking people around you for um for to to, to um asking people around you i'm losing words right <laughs> but yeah asking people around you um if you have a question, just 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 to ask it so that you can actually learn and and uh, grow from there. Yeah, yeah, I entirely agree with you. I mean, you know, how to take action? Yet we can click the button, um, but again, I think it's given control to people. Um, one of the things we did a few years ago, I know I'm always going back, but we formed the Women's Independent Cinema House, and that was to get more women involved in them telling their story and how they were represented. And uh, they made a film um, because, no, they did a survey first right here in Liverpool, and it was just a Vox Pops, and they were just going around asking people, what work do black women do? And every one of them said they were cleaners, they had no other image of what black work women do. But out of that, the young women that were involved in the project, they actually formed this big exhibition called Hidden Strengths. It went up, we moved it on and it went to become a BBC Two film. But it was by them taking the action themselves and how they were represented. Did we, we, they changed themselves as well, being educated. And again, you can, change that action you know and have it you've got to have the tools as well to do it you know yeah um i feel like now is probably a good time to open it out to other people's questions um if anyone has them um Sorry, they, 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 they can't hear you. Oh, without. could they not hear me? So what I was saying um, was actually providing spaces. So like what had happened, say, for example, for, um, for George Floyd, um, I mean, we're all affected by that. Um, and with that, when we're talking about action and providing spaces. So at the time, yes, we've got sort of like a tool of digital, like Zoom or whatever it is that's there, but it's getting a group of friends and just having a conversation, you know, starting with those little conversation, then sort of like creates bigger ideas and those kind of things, creating spaces for people to be able to tell, tell the stories, talk about their experiences, have a place where they feel safe enough to do that. It's a place where we start creating ideas in order to create something bigger or smaller, whatever it is, those little pockets that, that you create. So that's what I want to just add on top of that. Did you guys hear that on Zoom? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of safe spaces is actually hugely important. Um, and the internet can do that, but it's also filled with nasty trolls. Um, um, and uh, I, I wonder how, how what, what the kind of, what strategies and tactics we can employ to sort of deal with that. Do you mean, sorry, do you mean on the internet? Mm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that kind of collective conversation can happen online, particularly transnationally, but it's also subject to so much um, vitriol. Yes. Well, there's got, 
Yeah, there's got the w- different ways of him. I just realized I was holding this in my on my other hand for so long that my hand got tight. But um, <laughs> um, there's got there's got ways of monitoring it. So like, um, I know with groups, for instance, you, you you've got certain rules you can put in place before somebody joins in. Um, and then there's got the the um the admin and things like that who can monitor to see if everybody's um you know like there's no um vitriol I suppose um going on within within um, the group itself um so that's just one way that just popped in my head now i'll pass it to b because i think it's going to say something okay um hang on. either one of you uh, cool yeah i was just gonna say we just have really really strict rules for getting in the group so our group will probably be about five times the size it was is if we just let anyone in but for us, it's more about having that safe space, having a space with the people who actually want to do stuff and who want to be involved and having this big, massive group. We just want a group where like-minded people can get together and really push forward for change. As Blue's touched on, you know, there's loads of options. So our group isn't public. You can't see it unless you're in the group. You know, we monitor comments, we monitor who's posting and things flag up. We've got like certain words. If someone types a certain word, it flags up. But the safest thing that we did was just made it really hard for people to get in in the first place so it's not just yes no questions you have to tell us why you want to be in this space you have to agree that you're going to be courteous and that you're going to support people from other communities not just the black community and to be honest we've only ever had one person who we've had to kick out the group and that was more because they had a heated debate and were just a little bit rude to someone else and we were like oh come on you didn't need to call them that but it wasn't even an issue of someone coming in to be a troll it was just they got a bit upset with each other and we were like right you'll have to go but it's it's a credit like I admin quite a lot of other groups and I know other people who manage groups and our group is a credit to us because we never really have to do anything and it's quite beautiful because you know you can't guarantee a safe space and I don't tell anyone it's a safe space because while while it is you know a safe ish space it's the internet and as you know Francesca's touched on the internet is not a safe space you can't make it safe but it is a listening space and it is a space where people can be heard and like one of the nicest things that I like think about the group is you go on and like there was someone the other week who was having a really tough time at work with racism and she put a load of stuff up and in the early days it would have been me and the admin team like oh okay we'll help you blah 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 you know you go to this person go to this lawyer do this do that and I think yeah I've been sick with COVID and I was like and I looked and I was like I hadn't got back to her there was like a hundred comments from everyone in the group it was like okay I know this person who's an employment lawyer I know this person down here like go here we're gonna help you come to mine I'll get you this and he's like he completely helped her and I didn't even have to say it and I was just like oh my god and I was like I was like looking at the people in the admin group I was like we've created a community where the help in each other do you know what I mean I like we don't have to do anything anymore we've created this gorgeous little community where if someone comes on and says I'm having a tough time at work or I'm having a tough time in my community everyone knows that we're going to help you within that group so I just thought that was really really gorgeous um, but that wouldn't have happened if in the early days we just sort of left it open and let anyone join and you know anything goes and anyone can post anything you do you do have to moderate and you do have to be a bit strict about what you'll allow and what you won't allow within the group setting that's it's just the way it is Do you find that there's a danger, though, about with closed groups that the conversation gets limited to itself? How do you how do you make sure that the conversation stays relevant, um, is pushing change that is meaningful to the way that society itself is changing, um, that it isn't just a kind of closed in conversation amongst a group of like minded people who aren't maybe, you know, you know, there, there is that danger that then you you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday that you then come out into out of your sort of little bubble of safe space and then you're confronted with the ugliness of, of reality. Definitely. I think that's always a risk, especially just with the internet the way it is. Um, Facebook, Twitter, all of the algorithms just are set so you only see what you like to see. Unfortunately for me, they actually do think that I like to see racism because I always read stories about racism, so they just show me more racism. But within our group, we kind of have monthly themes. So we have things that we talk about that are current and relevant. So, you know, when it was the Euro 2020, we spoke about the football, we spoke about what was out there. We'll sometimes have experts like on Tuesday, we've got an um, clinical psychiatrist. We're doing like an um, an event with a clinical psychiatrist to talk about black mental health and black trauma. So as much as we can, we're reaching outwards and bringing things in and not kind of, you know, mm-hmm. shielding people from the world because we don't want to do that. But I do think that if you've got a group, you know, you can't have a space with, say, the far right and 
black activists you just can't because one group hates the other and you'll never find that middle ground um and we you sometimes as you, you guys will probably know this as activists sometimes people do want to put you in a space with someone who literally wants you to die and I just will not be in the space with them because they're not about having a constructive conversation. They're literally about hating you and they don't want to find a middle ground and they don't want to find a solution. So it's not everyone. There are people who are, you know, racist because they just don't know any better. And those people, yeah, all day long, we'll try and educate them. But then there's people who genuinely enjoy how they think, enjoy how they feel and they don't want to change. And I just think it's a it's a waste of energy to try and get anywhere with those type of people. So I do think you should have a good mix of opinions, but I do draw the line at, you know, people who, who don't really want to be in the group because all they want to go in to do is cause trouble and to harm someone who is within that group set. And so it's a juggle and it's kind of, I don't think you'll ever get it right, but I think as much as we can, we have. Yeah, I was just going to, sorry. I'm just going to completely agree with you again and say, I think there's a risk that sometimes, um, there's a risk that sometimes people imply that, the work that black people are doing should always be public and visible. And um, when the reality is actually, you know, spaces that are more private, spaces that are more intimate and spaces, again, as, being, as has been said, that don't necessarily include loads and loads of people. They might be viewed as quite small spaces. And um, that doesn't mean that they're not important and it doesn't mean that they, they can't be very impactful. So I think that whilst there are times when the intention might be about amplifying a message, getting it out there, I also think it's equally important that we have those spaces and um, that serve a very different purpose and those spaces where black people can discuss things also amongst themselves without sort of anticipating an institutional white gaze. Um, and I was also just thinking in, in response to some of the earlier things we were speaking about, I'm conscious that there can be this expectation that black people have to be presenting a certain image to be viewed as worthy of respect and support when actually I think something that's been really great about digital culture is pushing back against respectability politics. It's not even about we need to challenge um, anything. It's people sharing their own experiences on their own terms. And sometimes that means making things visible and other times it doesn't. Yeah, just to add to everything that was said there from both Francesca, Chantal and Lena um, in the audience um, about spaces, it's like, um, and, and such on what you were saying there about like trying to avoid them. Um, you know, being in an echo chamber or like feeling like you're just preaching to the choir um, is you can literally create spaces that are the middle ground um, if you want that type of conversation. So like you have the, you can both, both can exist. So you can have the, the conversations in which you are just speaking to the choir, I suppose, I suppose. like you're just speaking to people who, who are like-minded with you and um, who, who, where you feel comfortable. And then you, you can create separate spaces in which two people with, with, with their, two two different camps of, of different ideas coming together to 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 sort of reach a conclusion that both can exist and do exist um, and I, I feel like that's actually the best way to do it because you got somewhere where you can where you can just you feel more relaxed and where you can learn and and learn how to like articulate yourself because you might have great ideas and um great great thoughts that but you just don't know how to articulate it um and you need to like i don't know go to your family um like your, your group um so just kind of hash it out um and then 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 you're it's easier for you to then have these conversations with the people who you know who you want to have the conversations with yeah absolutely um there more questions Um, I suppose this is for everyone, but um, particularly interested in Francesca's point of view in terms of um, sort of looking at council culture and the risk of that, that whole thing in terms of like layered issues like this becoming simplified and like decontextualized. Um, so within this con context, like where does that sit? And is it, is it a dangerous path that we're going down? Um, what I'd say in response to that, um, Meredith Clark's done really great work on, um, so, you know, so-called cancel culture and also, you know, thinking specifically about call-out culture and um, the roots of call-out culture and the experiences of Black people often speaking truth to power. So I think what I'm really conscious of is when individuals or institutions will claim someone or something has been cancelled, but the reality is that person is just being 
very rightly critiqued by those who are most marginalized. So definitely I feel as though we've all been saying, you know, we don't think there's this utopian view of social media and digital technology. We're, we're aware of all the problems um, that surround it. But for me, I think there are times when people who are highlighting issues to do with injustice are dismissed and are accused of cancelling somebody or something when the reality is I'm yet to really see an individual or institution who has rightly been called out actually face any significant um, sort of repercussions as a result of that. I agree and um, when you say cancel culture the two people who spring to my mind are Pierce Morgan and um, Shadden Osborne and they shouted very loudly to the like five million followers or God knows how many, how they were being cancelled while actually not, there weren't really any ramifications to what they were doing other than them saying really loudly, they're cancelling me, they're cancelling me. And I thought, no, actually you're just being held to account for really inappropriate conduct, which is what should happen. So usually the only people you hear shouting about cancel, cancel culture are people who've been called out, rightly so, and have had to account for themselves for doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. They never really lose the job someone just says that what you did there that was wrong and you shouldn't do it again and then they spit the dummy out and say they're being cancelled like do an interview about being cancelled do a million tweets about being cancelled and they get more attention than they've ever had and I'm like how were you cancelled yeah. yeah that was Katie Hopkins is another person like that um, I was just thinking about um black people and mental health and how that's not often talked enough about as well and being activists and being you know active artists how do you avoid burnout I, and is it inevitable you know is it going to happen but how what self-care steps can you take to help avoid that who wants to start with that one that's the big one that one um, I don't mind starting with this one. Um, so I'd say it, there's a huge risk of burnout to any person who's black just living in the world that we live in, you know, living in a world where you're a minority. I'd say it's kind of been exasperated over the last two years. And if you're someone who's engaged in activism, then again, that's another compound of kinds of mental pressure that you're under. For me, um, Dr. Marv, who I mentioned before, we're doing an actual um, panel discussion on Tuesday. If you check out BLM or any of our socials, it's on there all about black trauma, black mental health and tips for black mental well-being. And I did a discussion with him about a year ago and the best tip he ever gave me was develop mastery at something that isn't anything to do with being an activist or, you know, racism or trauma develop a hobby that's completely different to that and that takes you away from that and that takes your attention away from that like preferably something that you're doing where your hands and your minds engage so I'm really into like cycling and yoga and any exercise like running anything where my phone is not in my hand because for me my phone is just it used to be fun my phone but now it's just a massive source of stress because everything is always like yeah the people sending me racism or it's just to do with activism which I love but you shouldn't have it 24-7, whereas phones are 24-7. So quite often you'll see my phone just be face down and I'll be doing something else. So for me, it's really important to have to know that this is a fight that will be here. Hopefully not in, forever in my lifetime, but it's going to be here for a while. And if I want to be here for a while, then I have to be able to take myself away from the fight, whether it's an hour a day, whether it's a weekend, whether it's a month, however long I need to mentally recover, because it's that whole you know, airplane scenario, you can't give to anyone else while you're ignoring yourself. So you have to put your own mask on first before you can save anyone else. So you do have to just be aware that, you know, you're not letting anyone down to take time away. You're not letting yourself down. You're actually replenishing yourself and you're looking after yourself. So don't feel guilty about wellness and, you know, looking after yourself and looking after your own mental well-being. Just do it whenever you need it for as long as you need it. And there'll always be someone else to take care of things. That's exactly what I was going to say there at the end, like not not feeling like don't don't put everything like don't put the world on your shoulders and think like I I need to be the one that says like this that, that, that needs to say all this because it's got other people around doing the, the same sort of things. So like if you uh, to, as to what Chantal says, it's like if you if you're not able to help yourself, how, how, how are you able to help anybody else? You know what I mean? So it's just like um just making sure that um. Yeah, just for me, like one of the things is just remem remembering that there's there's got there's got other 
people there and there's and there's all and also people if if somebody really wants um information especially um, being black um you sometimes don't want to have to go, relive like a trauma or have to um you, you probably already told like five different people a story and then somebody else comes and they think that like, it's uh, like they're asking you like a a, a new question you like already answered this like 10 times so it's like just there um also knowing that you know, like I said before, Google's a thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> there's, got, there's got information out there. Like, if you really want to look for it. One one beautiful thing that I saw, like, last year when, when I was in, uh, 20, in 2020 um, was somebody, somebody ended up, a, like, a list of, um, of uh, like, a document, like, a Google document drive with, um, with like, information. I'll have to find it with, like, information around, like, um, like, the different black um uh, thing, things around uh, like BLM resources. resources that's the word I was looking for yeah they had, that's, self, I, was, self, I was like what's it called yeah self help <laughs> yeah so they had, they had a lot of resources there and it was so it was so great because at one point I was just feeling really tired and somebody else asked me a question on Insta and I was just like link I just sent them the link like it's <laughs> do, right do, there do, do, do you have a do you have a blue saint FAQ I should have that should I? <laughs> yeah. but yeah so there's there's just remember and Brenda, there's also got there's got those resources out there for people to go to yeah there's yeah. a lot there's a lot of, like you know i my favorite thing is directing people to the website let me google that for you <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah there, there is a, a hell of a lot of resources out there and i'm so pleased about that now which wasn't there before but uh, taking up um what chance health said you know about um black mental health i mean Somebody, I think it was in 2018, there was an action going on and somebody um, sent me an email and said, um, oh, B, uh, this is actions going on. And they said, um, are you going to be there? And I said, no, I said, because I'm doing it. He said, well, I think you ought to be there because you're a black woman. No. And it's that type of, that's what happens to you as well. People try and guilt you. And I said, excuse, I mean, I was able to deal with it. But what I'm saying, you know, they try to guilt you into um, you being there because you're, you're black. I mean, and that's what we used to do many, many years ago, because we, thought we felt we ought to be there at the expense of our own mental health, you know, out at every demonstration, out at every action um, without taking care of ourselves. But then you get other people saying, well, you know, you're a black woman, you ought to be there. Um, there's another question, um, lady in the pink dress. Thanks. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I think the other dr downside of social media is the intrusive nature of it and the intrusive nature of black trauma. And the times I've had to just stay off social media because of like the, the Euro finals. I could not bear the, the knowing that the, the previous experiences and the, the traumas that I've had in the past being replayed for people to per perform about how they, they're supportive, how they're anti-racist. And, and so I think it's very, very difficult for young people in particular to, to do that policing. Yet it, it's being aware, if you're aware of the need for self-care, it's great, but it's so insidious. Racism is so insidious and, it, and it, it, it's self-perpetuating because it's so clever, because it changes its guise, it evolves. Um, and, and I think, you know, there is there is an, an, an issue and a conversation to be had about how do we police and protect one another mm -hmm. within the, the context of social media to protect one another's emotional and, self, and and it's physical as well as emotional well-being, because what happens in your head happens in your body. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. so, you know, how do we do that? How do we separate? Because if you are as an activist, you actually make a choice to engage in something. But when mm. it's on your threads, when it just pops up, when you're looking, how do you then step back from that? Because people don't, aren't going to put trigger warnings on. You know, it, it's just a part. And I think that's something that we have to be very mindful. And it's very important to have conversations about the impact that it, it, it will have on our physical and uh, emotional well-being. It's a very good point. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. 
the, the only thing I was going to add is, I mean, completely agree. And I think that there are times when people who, even in a well-meaning way, feel as though they're being supportive or helpful by sharing content, by sharing um, video recordings. Again, I'm especially thinking about since last spring, um, or even if it's organisations reaching out, as they'll say to different Black people, to speak up about something or to feature on something. And oftentimes, again, they're actually wanting them to be in dialogue with somebody who's going to be essentially attacking them. Um, so yeah, I think we have seen the ways that organisations and individuals even those who think they are expressing some sort of allyship, actually circulating material that can be incredibly re-traumatizing for black people. And I think, again, this maybe comes back to some of what we've all been saying about to do with visibility. This is never just about visibility or surface level representation. It's about so much more than that. And I, I'm just hopeful that we see people thinking twice before just retweeting something or or you know taking a beat to reflect on do I really need to be sending this to a black person I know when the reality is they'll be all too aware of this anti-blackness and um, that somebody perhaps is now only waking up to yeah I agree and it's my worry is that we'll become desensitized to quite traumatic posts that we shouldn't actually be seeing so for example the George Floyd video I have not watched that video from beginning to end because I never needed to watch that video and I knew I never needed to see it I knew what had happened I knew what was going to happen when I saw it and I said I never need to watch that and I should never watch that I just knew that I never needed to watch it so that was one of the days when I was like right I'm off social media for the day the Euro 2020 was another but I think there is a trend of well-meaning and usually I get the most graphic racist posts from well-meaning people who tag me in it or go have you seen this and I'm like yeah 50 people have sent it to me today so I think we need to understand that to fight racism doesn't mean that we should be okay with seeing quite graphic racism as normal on our news feeds because that's not okay and as you know the person in the audience has said as activists there's a level of us understanding that we will see that but then young people and people who aren't engaged in activism how do they protect themselves and I think social media companies do need to step up because if I write covers on a post even if it's just to tell people I've got covers I get a covers warning like covering me posts yet someone can post the n-word someone can post you know a black person being harmed on social media there's no there's no cover there's no you know warning nothing comes up on that so I think it's a bit poor for them to come to us and say, oh, there's not only can really do when we know there's quite a lot that they can do and we know there's a lot more that they can be doing to be protecting people from graphic racism. But it's the whole chicken versus egg scenario because there are people who will argue that without that George Floyd video circulating, we would never have got the result that we got in court. We would never have had the BLM movement. But I, I, I don't think society should be going to a place where we have to see graphic racism and violence in order to be able to fight it. Yeah, I did the same thing as well with the, with George Floyd. Oh, okay. Yeah, with George Floyd, um, with the video, I didn't watch it for for quite a while. Um, with me, uh, Lena, who's also in the audience, uh, conducted the um, a Zoom a uh, Zooms around what what happened, and um, it was through I I I. I got an idea of what happened more so from what people said um, and from the Zooms and things like that. And then I watched it a few, a, a, a few weeks after everything had already happened. But yeah, that was actually one of my worries too, is like um, with a lot of, with, with being able to just view like graphic um, uh, scenes, I didn't want to, um, I never want to reach the point where like, I feel like I've become desensitized to, to anything. Um, so yeah. Do you think, I mean, uh, part of me wants to, to to wrap things up but there's a thought that's just occurred to me while you you two were talking and it's about the normalization of violence and also an expectation that um violence can be enacted on black bodies and that there's an expectation to see violence being enacted on black bodies and how do you um denormalize it <laughs> How do you, how, you know, if, if you don't show it, um, that's one thing, but the point is it's still happening. So to some extent, people need to know that it's happening. And so how do you, how do you, what, how do you break down that sort of catch 22 by sort of making it known, but not necessarily uh, sensationalizing it or normalizing it to such an extent that you expect it it's very very difficult i mean i, I don't i don't you know because you you, you want to see it's really important that we, you know that we're communicating all this stuff but then you know how are we going to act on how are we going to act on it um 
it's really, you know, I think we're all put in this precarious situation all the time. I mean, you know, on the phone, I get things on the phone, you know, have you seen this? This guy said that, somebody said the N-word to this. And you just feel, oh my God, how much more stuff? It's imp- I want to know, but then, y- y- you know what I mean? I don't want to disregard it either. It's, it's really difficult. I think one of the one of the things that Chantal was saying there as well is like you know, one of the ways of this this obviously there's I don't think there's one good way of um, dealing with it, but the idea of when Chantal mentioned that um there's got uh, where if you type in anything to do with COVID a COVID um alert pops up there should be those sort of like some those yeah. those sort of things happening with with him um, with things around racism yes. and the like you know um. It, it gives you like a like a warning, warning. Yeah, yeah um i know that back uh, um i don't know when it was but they had a they, they had a shooting that that occurred in america a couple of years ago um where somebody went and and, and i think he went to a mosque um, and and shot up a lot of, uh, that, of was in new zealand, yeah. that was in new zealand but they also had another one that happened if so I'm, I'm conflating two different stories yeah. but they had another one that happened in, in america as well where they shot where, where somebody was going around killing people um, and they bled the uh, the video and they said like uh, tr- they give you the trigger warning saying that it's gonna be uh, it's got uh, you know it's got graphic um um violence. violence in it yeah so it's just like having those sort of things is one way I suppose um of mm-hmm. that I think that so- social media needs to put in, in place yeah, yeah. but how, how would that happen I mean it, it's going to need somebody and all you know for, for that to be implemented like we get you know there's a thing on children on the bbc have it you know all the time um how how do we get that to happen mm, and who's going to do it yeah yeah i think just to sorry question and then question I was, sorry I'm just going to add to that I think there's a definitely a bias in the media towards black bodies and there's a push from the media they're okay with seeing black bodies harm but if it was you know someone of another race then there's not so much there's more of like that blaring or that censoring of that violence being shown um, and I think it's something that as activists it's we need to change that um, kind of narrative because it's very against black people all the time that's all that's all I was going to add and um, yeah I'm a portrait and documentary photographer and I do a lot of my activism um, through my artwork as well particularly for women and queer communities because that's um, my communities and um, but yeah on Instagram and Facebook and stuff I've had images removed um, with women's nipples and and things like this so you know Instagram has the power to do these things that they choose not to and they choose to penalize women's bodies black bodies fat bodies um, and all of these communities are being controlled and censored you know as so I, I kind of I relate to that from the same so from a different point of view as you but for the same reason and it's so frustrating that these platforms are being you know this is where we put up our work and then when you're being censored like that, it's really difficult to reach kind of other people. And it's only happened to me a couple of times, but I know it's help, it happened to like a lot of my peers. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it's right that if they can flag COVID um, or they can take down a female, they somehow know the difference between a female nipple and a male nipple. Why can't they <laughs> put, uh, put up, you know, yeah. there's no difference. But how some, somehow Instagram knows um, that they that they can't do more to support um oppressed communities yeah um but who's going to put the pressure or you know get that implement this is my thing how how do we get that you know i entirely agree with you and it needs to change so we're not having all these flags coming up and we do have the war you know we have the warnings coming up you know to inform us but how 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 do we get that implemented um we've got just a follow-up um it, but it, it's again it's it's another form of racism isn't it it's the way in which it morphs and it is yeah. and it's again it's part of the educational process that all these well-meaning people that that post and share information that causes us trauma 
that's part of their education. It's 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 an ongoing process that it's not okay. You know, I, I was 40 years old before I had my first mobile phone and I didn't have a smartphone till I was almost 50. And I managed to be an activist, I managed to be aware and I managed to be educated. So it's, you know, it's and I know it's 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 a it's a way of putting the genie back in the bottle, but communities have to, we have to teach people how we want to be treated. Yeah. It's not okay. It's not okay to do this. It's another form of racism. And that's what the, another battle. So when I was saying earlier that it constantly evolves and it morphs, this is just another yeah. example of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it's part of the ongoing fight and the struggle, but it's just something else that we have to deal with. And if people, you know, want to learn and they want to be, and I hate the term ally, um, if they want to be supportive and working alongside educating themselves and others, then that's part of the message that is given. It's changing the narrative. It's controlling the narrative yeah. and not just going along with what, you know, the people, because it's all about power. Um, and when you get people to recognize that the power balance and the dynamics that they're perpetuating, and we're all culpable, you know, we all have to recognize what we do to to maintain and, and to dismantle the, the power balances. It's all part of that educational process. Um, and yeah, we've got to see it as an us problem, not a them. It's not about getting other people to change. We've got to change. We've got to do, make, you know, get other people to change their work. It's not about getting Google to do it or, you know, major organizations. If it, it's a grassroots upwards process, this is not okay. I put messages out on my social media and said, you know, please bear in mind the impact this has on people from the black community. If we all do that, then we'll, people will stop sending us stuff. And okay. eventually, yeah. and it might not be the solution because it will morph and it will come out another way. But to deal with that immediate problem, that's, that's, a, that's an option. Francesca, you been... Sure, I was, I was just gonna say a few things in response. I completely agree, I think. Even the fact that often black people are referred to or viewed as black bodies as opposed to people as an issue. And, and in, in terms of how this connects to education, I think there's a normalization of, um, you know, well, first of all, the lack of black history that's taught across um, Britain is, is a whole thing in and of itself. But there's also a normalization of, you know, images in textbooks at, at schools when they do depict or, or engage with you know, the experiences of black people, those are often very violent images. So like has been said, this isn't just about tech. I think there is a normalization in terms of content that is traumatic for black people to have to be confronted with. And I think the expectation that these videos have to exist for black people to be believed is part of the problem. That is anti-blackness. There are many other experiences um, that happen whereby people would not be expecting a video to be provided. And actually they would see the existence of that video in and of itself could actually constitute a criminal act. But somehow when we're dealing with anti-blackness, people say, I need to see a video that's gonna tra you know, traumatize many black people in order to even entertain the possibility that this happened. So it was just to agree with all of what's been said and to, say although this the solution is not you know the solution does not lie with tech I do think that more can be done content moderation is a thing and it has as has been covered you're more likely to find that a black person is censored online than content that is traumatic for a black person to to come across is actually moderated in the way that it can and should be so tech isn't the answer but I also don't think we should let them off the hook when we see that content moderation and censorship occurs just not when it comes to addressing anti-blackness um, very quickly, just because I feel like we've been in a room, in a dark room for quite some time now, I um, want to say, obviously what's happened clearly from our conversation is that the nature of protest and the nature in which um, the communities organise and pull together to um, campaign, to, to challenge the system, to, to kind of question the structures of power and the, the systems with which power is exerted have been radically transformed by technology and social media, but the very nature of protest itself has changed. So what we've seen over the last 10 years, culminating last summer uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement was that protest itself looks very different to how it did 10 years ago. Um, it's less about the sort of, um, the anger comes out in a different way. The anger and the outrage at, that this is still these conditions still perpetuate come out in very different ways and that, that there's a 
different sort of impetus to how that how the power systems are being addressed um and i feel like there's still evidently a huge amount of work still to be done um i feel like that's that's all we can say really <laughs> yeah yeah but to put on the positive note a lot a lot of, of great stuff has been done too so we just got to just continue the work um, and continue spreading the word and making sure that the people also themselves make sure that they um, go out and become educated. Yeah. yeah. Just to, to, uh, final comments from the, the panel and then I think we're going to wrap up. If there's anything else you're burning to say right now. Yeah, I just, um, I agree with Blue here. I mean, we've, it's been a long time coming <laughs> as the song says, but, um, you know, we have seen some changes. It's not all hunky-dory, but, you know, there's little inroads, and in particular since, you know, BL BLM, that's helped us again. That's given us another thrust and, you know, helped us to realise, yes, we've, things still need to move on. So, you know, I'm I'm happy with with some of the things that that's happened, but I fully understand um, we've still got a long road to travel. Yeah, I just think if we look at Liverpool, look at the last couple of years, we've got our first black MP, we've got our first black mayor. We're getting there bit by bit, but I think anti-racism is a bit like a relay race. We have to pass the baton and just keep on pushing forward until we get there. So. We're the kind of next generation, but we've got to keep there with the generation that came before us, keep learning from them and keep pushing so that one day we don't have to pass back because we've we've done it, we've got there. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I think um, B, Blue and Chantal all said it best. It's never just about the digital, it's about different types of action. And also being aware that not everybody does have access to the internet, to a digital device. Um, and the work that you're all doing is so phenomenal because it's, it's never just about one or the other. Amazing. Um, I just thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here, but especially to be Blue, Chantel, and Francesca for your insight and your absolutely amazing work that you're doing um, out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, for those of you who haven't tried it yet, um, go outside. There's a poster on the front of the building. Uh, which has got the QR code for Uprise, which is BAF's uh, project. Um, and if you're free uh, in a couple of hours time, we will be having a closing party for our uh, exhibition at the moment, which is, features Black Obsidian Sound System uh, in our gallery one. And upstairs, we've got uh, uh, the artist Sheng Bo. Um, it's uh, part of the Liverpool Biennial, but we've got uh, Sable Sound System who are from Leeds, uh, basically having a closing party. So we will be having some DJ sets and drinks uh, in the galleries. So stick around. Uh, that's it. That's from six o'clock. Um, and it's a little street party. Well, I say street party, I'm not sure we're allowed to have a street party, but we're having a street party. Um, please edit this out. Um, <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.